All right, mate. Good to see you. You didn't like my haircut. Aye, I've just about managed to have an haircut. You, you look like you've not had an haircut. It's looking cool. Perceptive. <laughs> yeah, mate. No, no. Um, just waiting for a couple of people to join before I start doing my spiel and that. But thanks for joining straight away because it's always a bit, it's always a bit nerve wracking first few minutes. I can imagine. <laughs> uh, have you done a couple of these Insta gigs? Yeah, I did. Um, oh, I did um, rap party with Inua Allens and my phone overheated. Um, oh. and just and shut off. I was like, oh my gosh, what am I gonna do? Uh, to get my wife's phone, log into my Instagram, and like set it all back up while he was there oh. talking to someone. Overheated. Oh, Man, that's mad. Hot poetry it must have been. It must have been. <laughs> <laughs> Fair play to you, mate. Fair play to you. Oh, um, well, people are starting to join now. So just to introduce it, my name is Matt Abbott. This is a weekly Nims and Folks Insta session. Uh, obviously, during the lockdown, we can't be travelling around the country. But to be honest, that's presented a bit of a silver lining. And I'm just inviting my favourite poets from all over the UK to join us and just provide these really, really relaxed 30-minute sessions. Bit of chat, bit of poetry, just super chill. Um, so thanks, everyone, for joining. As you can see, I have Mr. Casey Bailey here. Uh, Casey is a, a writer, a poet and educator from Birmingham. Uh, his debut collection, Adjusted, was published by Verve Poetry Press in 2018. Um, he's got a wonderful um, list of achievements, including being in the 30 under 30 from Birmingham Live in 2018 and writing the poem, The Ballad of the Peaky Blinders in 2019. Yes, is that all right? Is that, a, a, is that enough to say welcome like to Casey Bailey? Always. Yeah, it always feels like too much, so that's plenty, yeah. Cool, sure man. Have that... been already. <laughs> How's it been treating you, then? Have you been all right? Have you been furloughed from teaching work? Or... Um, so it's interesting, so with teaching, because we have to provide work for the kids anyway, we're, we're just deemed as working from home. Um, so we haven't been furloughed as such, but um, I'm type 1 diabetic, so I've not been allowed on site at all. Um, right. So, yeah, so I've just been at home writing doing bits of work that I can do from home. And uh, yeah, it's been okay. Yeah, can't complain. Have you enjoyed the writing side of things? Have you been able to like, zone in and focus on something? Or? Do you know what? It's been really weird. I've written, like I haven't written a lot. In fact, I haven't written probably any more than I would when I'm at work full time. But what's really weird is I haven't been able to write the things that I need to write. So, you know, like we're coming into lockdown, you have that project and you thought, actually, this is going to let me get that manuscript finished. Or for me, it was a play. Yeah. So let, me, let me get the edits done on the play. Every time I open it up, I struggle. I'm like, oh, and I think it's like I've got to, I'm going to the phone over here, then didn't you? Might... No, no, it's all right. Um, I'm like convincing myself I've got more time, I think, like subconsciously. So yeah. then I'm not doing anything. Um, but then I'm just writing random stuff that's just like coming out of nowhere. Interesting, interesting. I've been so that's, that's weird because I've been sort of a total opposite. I can't think of anything random. I can only focus on something that was like a pre existing project. But oh, then when you think if you're trying to write a book and it's like, oh, it might be two years till it's published and now the world's falling to bits and you're like, well, <laughs> what's yeah. the point? <laughs> Why am I writing this? <laughs> no, but no, that sounds really cool, mate. That sounds really interesting. I'm glad that you've been been writing because I know some writers haven't been able to write at all. Mm -hmm. There's just been a total fog, which I, I fully understand. Like, yeah, yeah. Um, so that's cool. So, so what were you working on? Are you happy to share what you were working yeah. on? Or? So, um, I'm working on a, a play uh, called Grime Boy, which was commissioned by uh, Birmingham Rep and Belgrade and Coventry just before um, we kind of moved into a lockdown situation. Uh, so right. I'm getting some work done, um, but I thought I thought I would have like had three full edits of the play and gone through it, and and I haven't got there. Um, but I have done a bit of work, uh, and I'm working on. Uh, manuscript poetry poetry book called Please Do Not Touch. So, cool. Sounds sounds awesome. Yeah, I saw that the commission for Ground Boy. That sounds that sounds really cool. That so is that full? That's like a full play. That's not like a one man yeah. show. That's a... No, yeah, it's a play. A uh, couple of characters and story and all. Like when I first took the idea, so the rep and Apples and Snakes had um, this like poetic theatre makers project on. And I thought, I took this idea thinking it'd be like a one-man show. I'd get on stage, a couple of poems, a bit of interaction with the audience, a bit of grime, off I go. And as it developed, yeah. it's like, oh my God, it's going to be a play. Like, it's going to be a, a full-on like, theatre production. Amazing. Yeah. Terrifying. That sounds awesome. <laughs> um, I, so are, are, you, are you happy to, do you want to share a poem or two? Do you want to share anything new or do you want to fall back yeah. on an old favourite? 
Yeah, I'll, in fact, I'll start with something relatively new. So this um, was published in this amazing um, Poetry Birmingham Literature Journal. I think I know what page it's on, otherwise I'm going to mess this right up. <laughs> um, yeah. Who was it published by? Uh, so it's published in the Poetry uh, Birmingham Literature Journal, which is done by Pelina Press um, in Birmingham. Cool. Cool. And uh, yeah, I'm quite happy with it because I sent it and there was like a, there was a misconception in what I'd meant. And the editor sent it back saying, I really like it. Like I want to publish it, but like a few questions. And I was like, oh, those questions kind of don't actually link to what I'm trying to say. Um, so right. we kind of had back and forth, but I realized it did highlight that then there was, there was an issue with some clarity in what I'd written. So I'm, I'm happy with the final uh, outcome. It's called Tomorrow. Cool. Go guys. Tomorrow, he said. Somewhere between raising hoods and our knuckles separating, fists pressing love into ghetto goodbyes, he said tomorrow and meant it. The difference between broken promises and miscarried promises is intention. Green leaves cleaved from trees by young hands. Fallen before fall, evergreen was not the plan. How his brothers grow brown and withered in his absence, hoping only the claws of gravity will grasp them lest they be snatched too soon. The promise of winter provides no comfort. After witnessing cold bodies in warm climates, we don't ask for winter, only for tomorrow. Cool. Wow, nice, beautiful. Thank you. Love that. Yeah. Yeah, the concept of time is something that's really bending our minds at the moment, isn't it? I guess. 100%. 100%. Yeah, yeah. Thanks. Puts things into perspective. Or well, for most people, it does anyway. Yeah. yeah. Um, cool. Yeah. Um, so, w when you um, you published Adjusted in 2018, was that a yeah. was that a long time in the making? Was that something you've crafted for a, a like your whole life, or was it a bit of a burst of inspiration yeah. that led to it? I almost feel like I shouldn't say this, and I feel like when you when <laughs> when you read it, it might be evident. Um, although I've only had good feedback. Um, but I so I wrote a book the year before Adjusted called Waiting at Bloomsbury Park. It was a pamphlet, and I pull it out with Big White Shed in Nottingham. Um, and Stuart, who, as you know, Stuart Bartholomew, who, who runs Verve, uh, said to me, like, he really liked it, and he wanted to basically do, like, an extended version. So he wanted to be waiting at Bloomsbury Park, all of those poems, and then uh, uh, another, basically, double that amount of poems. Um, and I, I, I didn't feel comfortable with it. I felt like a bit of a cheat, like, if somebody buys the book, and they're like, hold on a minute, I've, like, read all of these poems before. I've got this book at home. Um, so I said in the time between publishing it and him talking to me, I'd written uh, a few more poems that I was quite happy with. And I said, I'll get, like, I'll get a new book written. Uh, and he said, and it was in about July. And he says, yeah, well, you know, I'm planning to publish it in April. So I was like, <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, <laughs> and we got it done. And um, I was happy with it. And it was literally, at the time I was like terrified. I was like, I can't do that. And I went home. And I, all of a sudden, you, when you've got something to write for, some form of purpose, your mind starts thinking, well, I want to get this in there, I need to get this. And I had loads of concepts, and then I started kind of crafting them into poems, and I was you know, relatively happy with it, yeah. Amazing. So, Necessity is the mother of invention, as we say. <laughs> Definitely. Definitely. But like... But like you say, when you've got a project and you've got a collection, you've got a publisher, you've got a date, it's, I, t to be honest, I struggle to write outside of that now. You know, like just frivolously, just, ah, oh, fancy writing yeah. a poem. <laughs> like having that mindset, I think, is really useful. So, yeah, yeah and I'm, 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 that's, that, that sounds relatable, to be fair. Like, yeah. if you spend 10 years writing a book, like, yeah, yeah. Six, six, six months is much more likely. Um, so do you fancy giving us something from Adjusted, or what? it's entirely yeah. up to you what you read? Yeah, but, yeah. Um... I'll read, I'll read two from Adjusted. That's cool. Cool. Um, cool yeah. So the first one is called We Drink For Them. We stand, heads bowed on a street corner that he used to stand on. His head up, shoulders back. A passerby might think that we're praying. We don't pray. I grab the back of your neck and clutch it like you were him. You hold me like you recognise I'm not. My dry palms heavy on your sweat wet skin. My eye contact exposes me to an agony in your eyes that I'm petrified to share. We're passing a bottle of steamers around. No cups. Chests getting warmer as our hearts grow colder. Alcohol has always been medicine here. Never a cure. 
two empty bottles on the floor as we dive again. The bottle is faster. We swim deeper. You pour a little to the ground. Dead home has got to drink. We manager, mmm, keep tipping. Tip it for the boy raised in a grim cul-de-sac. Tip it for the boy in the middle of a ghetto crumbling. Tip it for a boy who lost his dad to crime and lost his life to criminals. Tip it. There's only so many ways you can say dead end before it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. Now we listen as you share your philosophy. Everybody has to die. Nobody likes it, but either way we have to live with it till we don't. You simplify complex pain, bridging deep wounds with shallow words. We accept it. He was your brother. As the bottle speeds up, each new drinker calls a name, putting life back into our dead friends. We drink for them. It's all we've got. Cool. So that's We Drink for Them. Uh, and Steamers, if you don't know and you're listening to this, is an extremely cheap alcohol uh, of the caliber of like MD 2020. Um, that we, uh, we used to drink when we were standing around in corners and, and obviously being very good and just sharing poetry. Um, <laughs> uh, and the next poem is called uh, Multiple Choice. And uh, as a content warning, it deals with uh, suicide. Um, and it's around the stigma that, that is attached to suicide and, and how, like, how kind of ridiculous that is. Find a new place to hang this noose. Stop killing those who have already killed themselves, like they haven't suffered enough already, carried enough already, died enough already. To label someone a coward when they are no longer here to represent themselves has to be the worst cocktail of cowardice and hypocrisy that I have ever tasted. Maybe he did it because he saw no hope in this life. Maybe she did it because her only hope is that another life would follow. I always thought the most difficult multiple choice questions were the ones where you feel like all of the answers could be right. Gravity is pulling us all down. And just because bricks fall faster than feathers, it doesn't mean they're weaker. They just carry more weight. A man who looked young but aged with a face like distressed furniture once told me that the greatest misconception around suicidal people is the thought that they want to die. Nobody wants to die. The issue is, not everybody wants to live either. The most difficult multiple choice questions are not the ones where you feel like all of the answers could be right. The most difficult multiple choice questions are the ones where you are sure that none of the answers are right. And then you have to choose one anyway. Cool. Wow, that was stunning. Getting yeah. a lot of love, a lot of digital love as well. That was really... I take, yeah. digital love. I take love in all, all currences. <laughs> um, yeah in the first poem that uh, shallow words to heal deep wounds or mm -hmm. something similar that was stunning and then in that one yeah the whole multiple track just yeah breathtaking Thank you. such an important Thank thing to talk about as well obviously it is yeah um, it is it's, yeah. Um, we kind of skirt around it and 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 we don't talk about it until it's till it's too late to, to actually do anything about it too often so yeah a, yeah a reaction rather than a preemptive yeah I know what you mean um, yeah. Well, no fair play to you. That's yeah. That was that was beautiful. That was really powerful. You. Um, so you obviously you're born and bred in Birmingham, and you, you. I know you've got poems about being a Midlander, and like your Midlands heritage is very important to you. So do you, I know this might sound like a silly question, but do you think that's very much influenced the way that you write, or do you try and this like? Um, I don't know really. I think I, I always say so. I'm I'm a very proud Bromley, um, and a proud Midlander. Like my outside of Birmingham. My favourite place is Nottingham, um, which <laughs> most people don't have Birmingham or Nottingham as their favourite places. And then I'm really fond of Coventry, which is just ridiculous. Um, yeah. <laughs> but um, so like, so so I'm, I love Birmingham and I love uh, the Midlands. But weirdly, a lot of things that I think Brummies classically identify themselves with are not things that they're not they're not who I see myself as. And I think w where what I identify with is what um, young black boys in ghettos in Manchester would identify with ghettos in Nottingham would identify with ghettos in Bristol, London. Yeah, and I think it's more like a like that kind of the 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 black working class um, grew up around deprivation, and that is what I think influences my write my writing in terms of content more 
Um, I think use of language is is just a brummy thing, I think. Um, so yeah, so I think there's a, a balance between those two things. That that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, but of course that makes a lot of sense. Like, yeah, being being proud to be where you're from, but it's not the be yeah. all and end all, is it? It's not a, it's just sort of you wear it as a badge of honour, but it's not yeah, yeah, I was just curious as to like yeah. Influences in terms of like, I'm sure you get influence from music as well, like I do, and like you know, it's you can have a shared relationship with someone from the other side of the world, can't you? And I think that's the beauty 100%. of poetry and words, isn't it? Yeah, hundred percent, absolutely. Cool. Um, nice one. Do you fancy sharing a couple more? Or? Yeah. So I'll share some some of my the new ones from uh, what will be called um, "Please Do Not Touch," and the premise, just to give it a little bit of context, uh, and I'll just share a few of these then. Um, the so interesting time now to be talking about this collection. Uh, I've been work I've been working on this collection longer than I was working on Adjusted, which is like since before I was working on Adjusted, which is really weird. All um, oh, right, okay. Yeah, um, I started making notes and stuff around this in in 2012 um, when I was on holiday in Canada. Um, and something struck me, and then it's kind of stuck with me ever since. And the the concept of please do not touch is when we go to. Um, like now it's very focused around like National Trust, English Heritage, um, those kind of museums, those kind of places. We, we're surrounded by things that were taken from all over the world um, as part of the you know, British Empire, which are now labelled, please do not touch. And the irony of, of people telling you not to touch stuff that wouldn't have been there if they never touched it in the first place um, <laughs> is, is not lost on me. So, so the, the collection kind of deals with that it deals with then some of the ramifications of colonialism um, and unfortunately, hip yeah, hypocritically, it deals with the fact that I enjoy going to National Trust places and watching my son run around in the grass like I did it when I was a child. <laughs> so all balance, all the balance. Uh, yeah. So yeah, there's a couple. Uh, some of them are really specific and some of them are a bit more generic. So there's this poem's called The Ruin um, and it's about a place um, called Shubra Estate. And this is about a monument at Shubra Estate. Cool. The monument in the garden isn't falling down. It was built like that. The architect admired the aesthetic of ancient Athens. Dilapidated statues leaning, old men on canes before hip replacements. Struggle and pain are so romantic and sexy to those who have never known them. In a world where the Rottweiler gnaws off his own tail to wag its stump for sympathy and rhinoceros shed their horns for attention, the ruin fits. With sunlight splintering off the river, giving light back to a structure that only throws shade and dragonflies jiving across its dance floor, it is wondrous and elegant and magical and a wish. I never knew its story. Um, yeah. Um, so that's the ruin. Um, and from the same place, being thematic, uh, this is called When Your Brother Died. So in, um, at Shubra, there were two brothers who lived there. Uh, they have like the reputation of like naval generals. But what they actually did is they were from anywhere else in the world and we were telling their stories. We just call them pirates. Um, wow. so they're, they're generals and they went and they sailed for Britain. So we have to remember that. Um, and one of them... And one of them had big plans to change the estate and the other one disagreed. And the one who disagreed was Richard and he died. And then his brother used all his money to change the estate. Uh, and I just like, right. that, I like, I like that they even treat their brothers with the same level of disdain that they treat everybody else. So it's called When Your Brother Died. When your brother died, you spent his fortune on your dreams. Built your grand estate on the back of his stolen wealth like it was yours, like it was his. He'd have loved it. Grecian taste, oriental magnificence, how to dress opportunistic betrayal so it may strut. How graceful can greed be? Who taught you to take so well? Which marauder unlocked your potential to unlock, relock, annex, asseverate, own? Did he know? Had he seen boomerangs before? When he threw you, could he foresee your return as a vulture? his future as carrying, how proud he'd be. Uh, Amazing. Yeah. But I love them um, poems and th in that first one, that, what is it? Um, pain and grief are so romantic to people who've never experienced it. Something yeah. like, just, 
Yeah. And you know, and immediately you know it. You've seen them. They, uh, the, oh, whose daughter was it? It's someone famous whose daughter recently was out. I think it might have been Michael Gove. Well, I might just be saying that because I don't like Michael Gove. Um, someone's daughter was outed as like having a TikTok where they acted like really edgy and like ghetto. Yeah. And actually yeah, they were just like super posh. Um, and they love it. It's great for them because they don't have to actually go to bed in it. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah. yeah, poverty porn and all that. It's ridiculous, isn't it? Exactly, exactly. Um, yeah, so this poem's called Library. So what I've noticed in every big National Trust house, there's a huge library. And in a lot of them, there are books that are only in that library. And, you still, and you're just still not allowed to touch them. They just sit in like, that's it now, that's it. That, that Those books belong here. And a lot of them have like different notices about the library. You can read about the library. And so I took a collection of like different lines that they'd said about their libraries um, and wrote about it. But it struck me that the, the, you know, the power was more than financial. It was, it was more than race. It was, the power was in the knowledge. And they made sure that they kept that knowledge in their house for their children and not for anybody else's. So this is called yeah. Library. This room is book lovers. This room is a testament. This room is two generations. This room is additional shelf space. This room where children read politics by the fireplace. These politics that place children by fires. This room coated now in dust or ash. We discover how weeds became flowers, how light became controlled. controlled. This room is a doorway. This room is a boundary. This room is a foundation. This room knows no ceiling. So that's that. that's called library. That's nice. me being, being angry about people with power keeping all of the books. At least let us have books. Yeah, I wish uh, enough, I we can get the books. We'll get the power. That's the secret. That's the secret. <laughs> a lot of things have changed in the last few hundred years. Yeah, yeah exactly. Um, that yeah. was beautiful, man. Um, so it's just gone. It's just gone ten to time flies, doesn't it? So. Um, if there's any that you definitely want to share, like obviously if you don't want to read anymore, it's it's entirely up to you. But I'm just sort of letting you know, it's about ten, well, it's just gone ten to so, whatever you want to do really. Cool. Um, so I think I'm going to do a wrap. Nice. And then I'll I might read one more from that from from the new stuff. Uh, yeah. Cool. So the wrap goes like this. Walk with me. Let me show you what I've seen. Take you on a journey through the places that I've been. Jump in the passenger seat, I'll tell them you're with me. And we can take it all in through my windscreen, police lights, gunshots, kids screaming. I've seen these nights on those blocks. I've been dreaming about more for our children before these roads killed them. Look at how our youths are broken. Any time we rebuild them, time we took a chance, time we made a change, time to look them in their eyes, realise their pain, look into their darkness, help them see a light. In fact, look into their future and just help them see a life because right now I'm seeing too much death. I can't stand it. Still, I stand up to pull it in the way they understand it. Sit down with them. Really try and listen. They tell me it's hard to plan when your friends are murdered victims because it's hard to think in years when you live your life in days. Hard to dry your tears when you live your life in pain. We know it's hard to face our fears and to go against our peers. Now, how are you supposed to chase your dreams when you know all three are the same? They need hope. Someone to tell them they can cope and you're dope enough to push so you don't need to push the dope. You are grown enough to know. Young enough to learn. You've been cool enough to chill. Now you're hot enough to burn. You are powerful. You are powerful. You are the root, you are the stem, you are the flower. I know you've been through it and you feel stuck in it, but don't let your last minute jeopardise your next hour. I don't let my last hour jeopardise my next minute. Boy, I get it. Until the day I'm dead, I ain't finished. They told you half the story. If they told you that I'm gifted, I've been grafting, I've been grinding, I didn't make it here by wishing. Man, listen, I am different. So don't compare me to them. Ten years ago, I was broken. Compare me to them. Couple choices could have seen me spend some years in a pen, but I'm here, so I will make a difference here with this pen. Cool. I like to rap. It's fun. Yeah, <laughs> Cool. Did you um, um, did you find that you were influenced by music before poetry, or did they sort yeah. of happen side by side? Or yeah, so what so what happened is when I was um, I used to say when I was younger. I think I have to say when I was young now. That's how old I am. When I was younger, um, I like I only wrote music. So I wrote rap and I wrote grime music. Um, and I was growing up in inner city Birmingham, uh, a place called Neutrals, which I love, but I can't say it's lovely. And I was growing up around gang violence, all kinds of stuff, and my music was reflecting that. And at the time, I felt like in reflecting that, I was, um, I was helping. Um, and then there was someone, a particular young guy who used to keep around me, and 
try and keep him out of trouble and out of bother. And he, he went and he did something like very bad, very reckless. And, and people called me to come and get him and take him away from the situation. And I said to him, like, what were you thinking? Like, why did you do that? And he said to me, it's like you say in your song. And he quoted one of my lyrics back to me as to why he'd done what he did. And I was like, wow. Um, and that like knocked me for six, like, because I couldn't, even though I, I knew what I was saying and, and to an extent I knew what I was doing, I never thought about the real impact of my words at that time. Um, and so I stopped writing for a while and then I got back into it through writing poetry. Um, Right. Because in fact, I, I stopped. I started writing again. People are like, oh, we don't want to hear this. We want to hear the old aggressive, crazy stuff like say something violent. Um, and I was like, no, no, I don't want to do that, actually. Um, yeah. So then I, I thought, I, st I still want to write, but I can't write like that. Um, so I went through writing poetry and, and only through writing poetry and, and kind of did, like developing a, a situation where people saw me as a poet, could I then, did I then feel like I could rap again? Because people expect... Uh, the boy that I was to rap about a certain thing but when, when you say you know this is Casey Bailey he's a poet and I say oh, I'm going to rap as well you don't expect me to rap about um, yeah. negativity so it, it gave me another doorway back into to another one of my passions so, yeah. fascinating fascinating so it's like a sidestep and then I guess that perception that you have yeah. to deal with yeah yeah yeah, yeah. cool Very amazing good. Um. okay and I've changed my mind I'm going to read one last poem uh, cool. You've convinced me to change my mind. Um, this poem is about an inf about music. Uh, it's about really it's about my relationship with my brother, but it ties. There's a song tying through it. Um, and very quick little like backstory is my brother lives in Australia, um, and I wrote this poem in Australia with my brother. We don't see each other as much as I would love to see him. Um, and it's about how both of us came from. Oh, and it's about a, a, a mezcal. Uh, which is like a type of tequila called Marca Negra. And it's about how it's made. I think it's cool. about a lot of stuff. I don't know what I'm talking about anymore. I'll just read the poem. <laughs> it's called Marca Negra 23-12-18. J. Cole crooked smile plays in the background. Two brothers soaked in Sydney sunshine sigh a sigh of serenity as glasses reconnect with the table and they reconnect with each other. The mezcal strikes like a match down the throat. The smoke chokes as it rises back through the nostrils. Breathe it in, smoke it out. It's how it's made. It's why it's made. A wild agave burnt in a fire pit doesn't wilt. It releases the sweetness of sugar. Crushed before the fermentation, handcrafted in small batches, each one unique. Ain't picture perfect, but we worth the picture still. J. Cole's prop Proclamation allows two brothers formed from fire pits, crushed so many times, toast to sweetness of survival. Risen like smog from the inferno, still rising. Could be Nietzsche's Birmingham or Oaxaca, Mexico. Sometimes it's not about where you are, but who you are and who you're with. No smoke without fire. We will rise like Maya Angelou poetry, like smoke from the fire pit, like mezcal to the nostrils. We will rise like glasses in the toast and we will drink to that. Cool. Quality. Thank that you. was beautiful, man. Thank you so much. I, honestly, I've really, really enjoyed listening to your stuff. It's just been beautiful. Um, is there anything you want to plug? Anything? Obviously, your collection is available online, but is there anything yeah. you want to... Yeah, I've got a song out. It's called Change. So if you come over to my page and click the link in my bio, you can hear my new song. It's called Change. Yes. Casey cool. underscore Bailey on here, right? And then Mr. That's Casey right. Bailey. Yeah. That's cool. the one. Yeah. Amazing. Well, thank you, Casey. You've been wonderful as as I expected. Um, yeah, just thanks for so much for giving up your time. Thank and you uh, everyone who's watching, check out Casey. Give him a follow. Check out his song and his book. Cool. Respect. Cheers. Thank mate. you, Matt. Peace and love. Nice man. one. See you later. Amazing from Casey, as you just mentioned, he's such a wonderful guy. His work's amazing, and obviously music, theatre, poetry, just across um, so many platforms. And also, he's a great educator as well. I know he inspires so many people, so please follow him, check him out. Um, and join us again next week, same time, 7.30 to 8 o'clock, live on Instagram. Um, leading poetry talent from around the UK, really relaxed and chilled. Uh, my name is Matt Abbott. We're him some folks. Cheers. Mm -hmm.